Welcome to Dark Knight Films Reviews. I'm your host, Matt Spies, and today we are doing another ranking video. This time, I will be ranking all seven of the Hammer Frankenstein films. From worst to best. Now, as you've seen, I've done two videos like this already about Hammer's Dracula and Universal's Dracula. So, if you're enjoying these kind of ranking videos instead of just the straight top tens, let me know and uh, in the comments down below, and I, you know, I'll surely keep doing them because this is pretty fun. I'm enjoying this just as much as the top tens. So, uh, and if you like these videos, um, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Now, <clears throat> on to the ranking. Starting at number seven, we have Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed from 1969. Uh, this film, I saw that Terrence Fisher was directing it. I was really excited, to, you know, because Terrence very seldom lets me down as far as being a director on these things. He's always got some, does some great stuff. And he did. The beginning of this film, when we are first introduced to Peter Cushing's Victor again in the story, and we, we follow him and, and he's, what he's doing, he's so fun and he's so charismatic and it's so good what, what we're witnessing. In fact, they have this cool scene in which he gets this room with Veronica Carlson's character, where she rents out rooms. And at one point, he comes down into this area where, the, where you know, the, most people just hang out that, that live there. And uh, these three hoi polloi socialites are just sitting around gossiping. Peter's Victor does not join in. He just sits down at the desk in the room, um, pulls out a, a notepad or something and starts writing out some notes and, and doing some, you know, thinking and writing um, in the room with them. Then they start talking about Victor Frankenstein himself, you know, and he, you know, his, his eyes raise up and he listens. And then he goes right back to, you know, doing what he's doing. And then they finish their little gossiping session. And Peter's Victor stands up and finally says something. Excuse me. I didn't know that you were doctors. Doctors? We are not doctors. I beg your pardon. I thought you knew what you were talking about. You're damn rude, sir. I'm afraid that stupidity always brings out the worst in me. Stupidity? Yes, stupidity. It is fools like you who have blocked progress throughout the ages. You make pronouncements on half facts that you don't understand anyway. After that scene, I was so on board with him. I really loved him as a character and thought he was great. He finds out then that Veronica and her boyfriend, played by Simon Ward, are um, in some financial trouble, and, and he's been doing stuff uh, at the hospital where he works that's not above board. So Victor knows about their little secret, so he comes in and he does this little blackmail thing with him, which uh, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And then, not but a few, maybe minutes later, she's in her room, and Victor comes by her door, looks in. He pushes the door open, walks in. She looks at him, like, what are you doing? And then he proceeds to just rush her, force her onto the bed, 
and brutally begin to rape her. And this killed this movie for me. I was totally on board with his character throughout all the rest of it because he was behaving like Victor should, like the Victor we've known from the previous films. This sequence was completely out of character for him and it should have never been written. And I feel bad for Terrence and I feel bad for Peter and I feel bad for uh, Veronica Carlson for being in, put into the position to do that, have to do that. And it turned out it was the producer that wanted more sex and more nudity in the film. And really, the, there's no nudity in this sequence. You know, she, he takes her down and, and starts ripping at her clothes, but we never see anything, even though Veronica said she was fine with doing nudity in that scene. They didn't do it because Peter wasn't okay with that, which is good on him. But fight the whole damn sequence, please. Because this movie is hurt badly by that. So by the time the, the creature played by Freddie Jones is created in this thing, I could care less. I had completely lost interest because of this whole rape sequence that was completely unnecessary in the film. So that's why this movie is at the bottom of my list. And it is at the bottom of my list. It is, to me, it's the worst Hammer film ever. Coming in at number six, we have The Evil of Frankenstein, 1964. Um, okay, this film really lost me um, at the very beginning just because um, it completely drops any continuity with the previous films. All the previous films had something happened and it carried over into the next film and then it carried over into the next film. This one, it decided to like reboot how the creature was made, how the creature was destroyed. And it's supposed to be the original creature from Curse of Frankenstein. <laughs> and they just... It was just weird. This one, and the creature, they try to make him look like Boris Karloff, Frankenstein's monster, but they do it in such a cheap way that it just looks like shit. And I just... I just had no interest in this one. I really like the the little deaf and dumb girl that, that didn't, you know, couldn't talk in it. She was, she was pretty good, but... The rest of it... This is a travesty. Um, and it was a waste of uh, Peter Cushing's talents playing the doctor. That's all I can say about this one. Coming in at number five, we have The Horror of Frankenstein from 1970. Now, this is like a pseudo remake of the Curse of Frankenstein. And at first I heard that it was like this weird black comedy. But watching it, it was it was more just a really good Frankenstein movie uh, that, you know, has a few little humorous elements in it every once in a while. You know, it wasn't so black comedy that it's crazy, you know, or anything like that. It was really good. But Ralph Bates, once again, steals the show as... Victor Frankenstein, the only time any other actor in this series has ever played Victor, um, his maid that he has an affair with is Kate O'Mara, who was best known pr prior to this for the vampire lovers. Um, and, and then you have uh, the monster is played by David Prowse, Darth Vader himself. And then we have Ralph Bates' real love interest, which is Veronica Carlson. Always beautiful, always charming. Um, this was just a great little pseudo-remake. Um, 
it worked really well and I enjoyed all of the performances and I enjoyed what they did with it. It was a really good uh, film in this series. Not as high as some of these other ones, but it's 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 better than the ones under it. <laughs> Coming in at number four, we have Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell from 1974. Now, this one, uh, directed again by a great director in Terrence Fisher. Um, this one has Shane Bryant is joining Peter Cushing in this one. Um, and Shane Bryant, before this, the only thing I had known him from was Captain Kronos, Vampire Hunter, in which he played the stuck-up, uppity uh, son to the main uh, vampire woman. She had a a daughter and a son, and he was the, and I just thought he was weak in that. But in this, he's definitely better in this than he was in Captain Kronos. And uh, and then, of course, we have David Prowse back again to play the monster. But this time, it's a completely different looking monster. Um, and I don't know if I really like the look or not, but he's the most... Um, he is, this monster is the most played for your sympathy out of all the monsters, even though he looks horrible. I mean, he looks like a, a you know, a monkey m monster of a creature or something, you know. Um, but does a great job, uh, David Prowse does, in playing him, even under a shitload of makeup, unlike the last time um, he played the monster, which he didn't have as much makeup on. But, yeah, this is great. I mean, uh, Peter Cushing is charismatic and as cool as ever playing Victor in here. It's just great. Um, really cool little film here. Um, and it's set in a different situation where he's in a, uh, a in an insane asylum kind of thing. And, and uh, he's forming the creature within the, this place. That it's pretty good. Pretty good little movie. It surprised me because I remember seeing it back in the day when I was a younger kid and I just thought it was just stupid and it was trash. But now, with adult eyes, it's it's a really good uh, Frankenstein film. Coming in at number three, we have The Revenge of Frankenstein from 1958. Another great Terrence Fisher directed film. And this one being a direct follow-up to The Curse of Frankenstein. And this is how you do it. This is how you do it right. This is how you take a cliffhanger from the, from the last film and you pick up right where it left off and you, and you, you know, you maintain continuity and move forward into it. Not like not the way they did with the evil of Frankenstein, which, uh, like I said, it, it, had, it had completely just reset the timeline in a way and everything. And, and in a way kind of ignored this film. And I think this film is the superior film out of those. Um, so in this one, you have Francis Matthews, who is always good as usual. I, I've, I'm probably getting uh, nauseating from people here in me say how great uh, Francis Matthews is as an actor, um, but he is. I mean, I had, you know, when somebody is a good actor in something and stands out, you have to give them their props. And he does such a good job. And in this one, you have another ver very sympathetic, you know, I mentioned how in uh, Frankenstein and the Monster from Hell, you had a very sympathetic uh monster in it. This one's the same way. Uh, Michael Gwynn is your monster in this one, and he really um, he really makes you care for him. Uh, unlike, you know, Christopher Lee, who was just a straight, you know, monster. Um, most of the other ones are just straight monsters. You know, this one, he, you know, he really, you really felt bad for him and everything in, in certain points in this. 
And uh, so, yeah, uh, the set design, the uh, the look of um, Michael Gwynn's monster, he doesn't look as monstrous as the previous monsters or monsters after him. He looks more um, human, which is uh, was, was another uh, really cool difference with this film. Um, so yeah, I mean, Peter knocks it out of the park again, this one, and, uh, it, I love the cliffhanger at the end where, um, him and his assistant transplanted, um, Victor's brain into the, into his, a uh, new monster, and he was basically going to become the monster in the next one, and I hated the fact that Evil of Frankenstein did not carry over from that, that just, or irked the hell out of me. But yeah, this is my number three. And coming in at number two, we have Frankenstein Created Woman from 1967. Another directed by the great Terrence Fisher. And Terrence really, uh, he, he really brought it in the Frankenstein series and directed you know, because he directed five out of the seven of these films. Whereas the Dracula films, he only directed like a couple of them, which, you know, uh, that is disappointing because, you know, that, and that is why a lot of the Frankenstein movies are, um, stand out a little more because he is the director in a lot of them, except for uh, Frankenstein Must Be Destroyed, which it's brought down because of, you know, that that tasteless uh, rape scene that was forced upon them by the producers. But Frankenstein Created Woman is one of his best directing achievements. It is a very cool um, revenge kind of a film in which the monster is again almost like Revenge of Frankenstein. It doesn't look like a monster. It's Susan Dens, and she is so attractive. Even when she's supposed to be this hideously scarred and and you know can't you know she's got a, a messed up leg and and a and a like a hunchback or something to her, and even when she's playing that, she is attractive. Um, so, yeah, the, I liked her in this role, I really did, um, and of course, <laughs> Peter Cushing is as great as ever in this thing, as far as once he helps her, that he's transferred his soul into her, um, and that's the other thing that's unique about this one is the way that he creates the creature. He he basically finds a way to transfer the soul of a person into this little machine, and then he can transfer the soul back into the body of his choosing. Um, that is a very unique take on Frankenstein, and uh, it works because it is so unique. It is so different, but. As soon, it just shows how good of a character he is. Victor, as soon as he finds out that Susan's character is possessed and she's killing these, these idiots that caused the death of her boyfriend. Kill him. Kill him, Christine. Because her boyfriend is compelling her to do it. Um, as soon as he finds out about it, he he proceeds out there actively to try and stop this creature that he created. And uh, it's great performances all around the board. I just wish Susan had done more films after this. I think she would. She had the potential to be something really great in the film industry. 
It's a shame she only did like a Star Trek episode and, and a few, uh, and, you know, a few other small little roles maybe or something. And then just gave up Hollywood. It just sucks. Um, because she had such talent in this film. Dan, coming in at number one, we have The Curse of Frankenstein, 1957. This is the film that started it all. It's directed by Terrence Fisher, of course. So it is just as good. And being that it's number one, it means it's the best Hammer Frankenstein movie ever. It stars Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee as the monster. Then you have... Uh, Valerie Gaunt, who had played a very prominent vampire in Brides of Dracula, one of my lesser um, liked of the Dracula films, but she was very good in that film. And she gives a very good performance in this as this maid character in here. And uh, this one, the monster is portrayed as more sinister and when he's brought back he just he, he has no interest in be you know there's no sympathetic uh about christopher lee's version of the monster he is just a full-on monster and he kills several people before uh dr frankenstein and his friend decide well we have to stop this you know and then they end up eventually he gets stopped, and uh, then that sets up this cool little cliffhanger in which it looks as though Dr. Frankenstein is going to be executed and have his head lopped off at the guillotine. So, yep, 1957, this movie started it all, and it is the best one. It was a unique way of bringing the monster back, and it was well done there. It wasn't anything like the Universal Days versions. I mean, this is this is just a really good uh, Frankenstein film and an awesome performance by Peter Cushing. Uh, Christopher Lee, he doesn't really get as much to do in this one. He's more kept in the background, and uh, when he does uh, show up... Uh, Shit goes bad, and then, you know, it isn't long after that that he's, he is brought down. So it's it's not one of his better performances, and that's probably why he never did return as a creature in the future Frankenstein films. Um, but, you know, he's got... The, the reason he was most likely cast is because of his imposing presence. And, you know, that he can make the monster look gigantic. So... Um, yeah, this, this is my number one. And, uh, but let me know, what do you guys think? Um, what is your ranking of the, all, uh, all seven of the Hammer Frankenstein films? Let me know in the comments down below. And, uh, if you liked this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And remember... It's the Halloween season, so this is not it. We're going to have more, so keep an eye out. Catch you next time.